I'm Dr. Balaka from Wayne State University and today we will talk about alcohol and its effects on people's lives. Different types of alcohol can be used for cleaning as fuel or in a freeze in cars. The type of alcohol found in wine, beer and liquor is called ethanol. Alcohol is a toxic and sometimes deadly substance that can be used in a liquid or powdered form. Let's talk about nature and effects of alcohol. Alcohol is a psychoactive substance that leads to dependence. It causes 5.3% of deaths globally. Additionally, it contributes to over 200 diseases and injury conditions. Finally, alcohol causes numerous problems at work, school, and in relationships with other people. The subject of alcohol use is not straightforward. For many of us, Drinking has been connected with celebrations, parties, and relaxation, and meeting new people. It is quite normal to drink alcohol in many countries of the world. Alcohol consumption leads to increased tolerance and withdrawal that can be fatal. Alcohol influences structure and multiple processes in central nervous system. It leads to increase in intentional and unintentional injuries. In addition, Alcohol has been linked with increased interpersonal violence, crime, child maltreatment, broken families, and friendships. Finally, increased alcohol use is associated with liver disease, various cancers, heart problems, increased risk of tuberculosis, and HIV. Alcohol is also linked to a variety of problems such as poor relationships with friends and family members, reduced performance at school and work, not engaging in recreational activities unless alcohol is served. Alcohol affects the brain, causing difficulty in walking, blurred vision, slurred speech, slowed reaction times, impaired memory, and judgment. Up to 80% of people with alcohol disorder have a deficiency in thiamine. And some of these people will go on to develop serious brain disorders, such as Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. The syndrome consists of two separate conditions. Wernicke's encephalopathy is a short and severe condition. It includes mental confusion, paralysis of the nerves that move the eyes, and difficulty with muscle coordination. For example, patients with Wernicke's encephalopathy may be too confused to find their way out of the room or may not even be able to walk. Approximately 80 to 90 percent of alcoholics with Wernicke's encephalopathy also develop Korsakoff psychosis, which is a chronic and debilitating syndrome characterized by persistent learning and memory problems. Patients with Korsakoff psychosis are forgetful and quickly frustrated and have difficulty with walking and coordination. Such clients have problems remembering old information as well as learning new information. For example, they can talk about an event in their life, but an hour later, may not even remember having a conversation. What are the physical health effects of alcohol use? The long-term drinking can damage the liver, the organ which is mainly responsible for clearing alcohol from the body by breaking it down into harmless byproducts. Many people are not aware that prolonged liver dysfunction, such as liver cirrhosis, resulting from excessive alcohol consumption, can harm brain, leading to a serious and potentially fatal brain disorder known as hepatic encephalopathy. At least two toxic substances, ammonia and manganese, have a role in the development of hepatic encephalopathy. Alcohol-damaged liver cells allow excess amounts of these harmful byproducts to enter the brain thus causing brain damage. Hepatic encephalopathy can cause changes in sleep patterns, mood, and personality. Psychiatric conditions such as anxiety and depression, severe cognitive effects such as shortened attention span, and problems with coordination such as flapping or shaking of the hands are also common. In the most serious cases, clients may slip into a hepatic coma which can be fatal. Some evidence suggests that small amount of alcohol is linked with lower risk for heart disease and cancer. However, high-risk drinking has been linked with high blood pressure, heart attack, 
stroke, as well as various cancers, for example, in the mouth, esophagus, and stomach. Drinking during pregnancy can lead to a range of physical learning and behavioral effects in the developing brain. The most serious of them is a collection of symptoms known as fetal alcohol syndrome. Children with FAS may have distinct facial features. These infants also are markedly smaller than average. Their brains may have less volume, and they may have fewer numbers of neurons that are able to function correctly, leading to long-term problems in learning and behavior. Let's talk about alcohol metabolism. When alcoholic beverages are consumed, they are broken down or metabolized by our body. This is done with the help of an enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. The process is directed by the liver and involves kidneys. In the first step, the alcohol turns into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a toxic substance responsible for many of the negative health effects, such as cancer and liver disease, hangover symptoms, nausea and headache, when too much alcohol is used. Next, acetaldehyde is metabolized by another enzyme, aldehyde dehydrogenase, and is eventually excreted from the body. Alcohol dosing. Alcohol by volume is a universal measure of alcohol concentration in beverages. It refers to milliliters of pure ethanol in 100 milliliters of the beverage at 68 degrees Fahrenheit converted to a percentage. For example, 40% is a typical alcohol by volume value for tequila, vodka, or rum. Alcohol proof is an indication of alcohol content in a beverage. In the United States, proof is twice the alcohol by volume percentage. For example, 40% alcohol by volume vodka is 80 proof in the United States. The standard drink measure is a way of indicating alcohol consumption. Each standard drink equivalent is determined as 14 grams of pure ethanol in a beverage. Alcohol should be consumed in moderation and only by individuals who have attained the minimum legal drinking age, which is age 21 years across the United States. The moderate drinking means up to one standard drink equivalent per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men. Binge drinking or heavy episodic drinking is consuming four or more drinks within about two hours for women and five or more drinks in two hours by man. Heavy drinking is defined as eight or more drinks per week for women and 15 or more drinks per week for men. High-risk drinking is defined for women as four or more drinks in any day, which is binge drinking, or eight or more drinks per week, which is heavy drinking. For men, high-risk drinking is consuming five or more drinks on any day, which is binge drinking, or 15 or more drinks per week, which is heavy drinking. In the United States, 35% of individuals do not drink alcohol and 37% drink at low-risk levels. However, about 28% drink at levels placing them at risk for alcohol use disorder or other serious health consequences. 51.1 reported having used alcohol in the past month, which is considered current use. 24.5% reported binge drinking in the past month, and 6.1% engaged in heavy use during the last 30 days. What is blood alcohol concentration? Blood alcohol concentration, or BAC, refers to the percent of ethanol circulating in the person's bloodstream measured in parts alcohol per 1,000 parts of blood. In other words, a blood alcohol concentration of 0.10% is one part alcohol per 1,000 parts blood. Blood alcohol concentration is the same thing as blood alcohol level. 
The U.S. current national guideline used to determine when the person is unable to safely operate a motor vehicle is 0.08% blood alcohol concentration. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as DSM-5, views substance use disorder on a continuum of severity across four functions. The first function is impaired control over use. This function includes four criteria. 1. Inability to control the amount and length of use. 2. Persistent desire and inability to cut down or control the pattern of use. 3. Spending a lot of time trying to get the substance, use it, and then recover from the use. And 4. Strong desire, craving, or urge to use. The second function deals with the social impairment and consequences of use. This function includes three criteria. Criterion 5. Failure to fulfill major roles across main life contexts, at work, at school, or at home. Criterion 6. Repeated use despite persistent social and interpersonal problems. And Criterion 7. Giving up or reducing social activities, work, and recreation because of use. The third function deals with the risky use of the substances. This function includes two criteria. Criterion 8. Repeated substance use in physically dangerous situations. This includes drunk driving and engaging in risky sexual practices. And Criterion 9. Repeated use despite persistent physical and psychological problems. Notice that Criterion 9 focuses on such problems as liver problem, sleep, or depression. As you recall, Criterion 6 also focuses on recurrent use in spite of the problems, but that criterion dealt with problems in relationships, for example, with a spouse or child. Pharmacological criteria are the final grouping. Criteria 10 and 11 focus on the presence of tolerance and withdrawal symptoms. We often discuss the biopsychosocial perspective. Biopsychosocial perspective means that biological, psychological, and social factors are involved in the development, maintenance, and resolution of the substance abuse and disorder. In clinical practice, we often work with clients whose parents or grandparents had alcohol use problems. It led to increased genetic vulnerability. Growing up, the client has socialized in the drinking family culture Alcohol was in the fridge, on the table, at birthday parties, and at funerals. Client knew more about the use than his or her peers. He knew when mommy gets tired or upset, she takes some wine. He would see his dad watching TV with a six-pack. He wanted to be like his father. He wanted to try it too. When he first tried it, he fell in love with it right away. And he could hold his liquor, no headaches, no spins in the morning after a night of heavy use, and no more worries and anxieties. He could talk to girls and enjoy talking to other folks. It just felt right. Such stories that we often hear from our client help us understand the aspects of biopsychosocial perspective. What is known about the genetics of substance misuse? First, there is clearly a genetic influence on the development of alcohol use disorders. The regular alcohol use is about 40% heritable. Second, evidence points to multiple genes contributing to substance use disorder, even to a single type of substance use disorder such as alcohol use disorder. Third, researchers also found that genes that are involved in controlling the processes of alcohol metabolism in the human body demonstrate a potential for preventing alcohol use from becoming an alcohol use disorder. This happens because persons with such gene expressions tend to have a highly unpleasant physiological response to alcohol use. Fourth, genetic influence is not simply occurring at the level of specific chromosome sites, but also in chromosomal regions. These regions are areas where multiple chromosomal sites cluster. In addition, genetic influence shows in various polygenetic combinations when multiple genes interact with each other. 
Fifth, there seems to be some shared commonality in genetic vulnerability to nicotine, alcohol, and cannabis dependence, at least among men. There are also specific genetic factors for alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and cocaine. One common underlying genetic factor may be the presence of genetics linked to depression. For some individuals, depression and substance use disorder have common genetic influences. Next, the heritability of alcohol use disorder has been stronger for men. In other words, environmental factors explained a greater proportion of alcohol use disorder among women. However, this gender-based differentiation in alcohol use has become very weak in the recent studies. Let's talk about social context and physical environments and their relationship with alcohol use. Society tends to stigmatize behaviors that are seen as different and less desirable than what is considered the acceptable norm. Alcohol use clearly falls into this category. The stigma, prejudice, and discrimination associated with alcohol abuse creates barriers to accessing necessary care and support for individuals and their families. Social, public, and health policy are tools that can be used to influence people's substance use patterns. For example, state and federal policies that increase the legal drinking age and established a uniform blood alcohol level for intoxicated operation of a motor vehicle are examples of social control actions that influence alcohol use behavior at the individual level. The physical environment is another factor that can increase or limit a person's access to alcohol. Because it is easier to buy alcohol, it increases the opportunities to get it, as well as makes it more normal to use it. As we transition through various social roles and life stages, our alcohol consumption tends to change too. For example, attending college may increase the risk of risky drinking due to increased peer pressure. Stable employment, on the other hand, is often associated with reduced drinking. Children grow up under the influence of their families. If parents are using alcohol, children learn that this is normal. They often have access to alcohol that parents keep in the house. Peer influences are a significant risk factor during adolescent age. If parental monitoring and supervision is weak, Children are more likely to interact with antisocial peers and engage in alcohol use. The social ecological model was first described by Yuri Bronfenbrenner. This model explains the impact of multiple levels of social systems on individual development and behavior. These social systems and institutions interact and include micro, meso, exo, and macro system elements. According to this model, an individual has his or her personal biological and psychological makeup. However, the genetic component in the substance use does not fully explain the risk of development of the substance use disorder. Family members, partners, and close friends shape the way we perceive the role of substance use in our lives. Depending on where the person is employed, they can have more or less strict policies around substance use. Also, some country policies and culture impact substance use pattern. For example, you are statistically more likely to drink vodka if you live in Russia than if you live in the Saudi Arabia, where alcohol of any kind is banned. The values and belief systems of different cultural groups vary a lot. Culture's value and belief systems influence the policy. Labeling theory. Labeling theory is a sociological term used to explain individuals' deviant behaviors as resulting from having a deviant label applied to them. According to this theory, people are influenced by the labels applied to them. For example, a person is more likely to continue drinking if they are labeled as an alcoholic. The impact of isms. Experiences of oppression, discrimination, and exploitation based on racial Eth, social class, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious, disability, or national origin factors can be linked with increased alcohol use. These experiences can be associated with higher stress and many people will use alcohol as a coping mechanism. 
family as a social context. The family is often viewed in systems dynamic terms. It involves the interactions, relationships, and roles that exist across the family. Both individuals affect the system, and the system affects individuals. Children in the families learn the desired behaviors through reinforcements and observations. Families are embedded in the larger social contexts, such as extended family and friends, spiritual centers and organizations, healthcare, and child welfare systems. Substance use can be a source of stress and a coping mechanism used by the family members. Families can also play an important role in the development and treatment of substance abuse. Family members engage in various roles necessary, for example, to get food and provide shelter and protection for children. When a family member develops an addiction, it can impact everyone in the house. This is because considerable resources will be spent on substances or on dealing with negative consequences of substance abuse. One of the key areas that often gets affected is parenting. Parents who misuse substances are often emotionally unavailable to their children. They can be neglectful, and children may lack in food and clothes. Parents can provide poor monitoring and supervision to their children. They might be less likely to attend parent-teacher meetings or help children with their homework. As a result, children in such families can develop behavioral problems, including substance abuse. Family disease model implies that substance abuse can negatively impact couple relationships and parent-child relationships. Still, family members and others in a person's social context may play a significant role in recovery process. Peer groups as social context. Just like the family, one's peer group provides a context for learning through behavioral reinforcements and punishments. Also, in peer groups, individuals learn from others through social learning, observation, and modeling. In groups, individual learns about substances, how to use them, and where to get them. Peer groups often define what is normal and what is not. Parents can steer the future of their children by providing or limiting access to certain peers. Some parents, for example, especially those who live with substance abuse, may not really know about whereabouts or acquaintances of their children. Other parents have a strict control and supervision of their children. Some families send their children to private school where they can get the best education, socio-emotional skills and lifetime friendships with peers from other rich and successful families. Other families can barely afford renting a place in a low-income neighborhood with low-quality schools and fewer opportunities for children and adolescents. Peer support. Peer support model has been widely used in prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. This model is used with children, adolescents, and adults. In this model, Individuals with similar lived experiences assist others who may be at risk of developing substance use disorder, trying to help them avoid this negative outcome. What's the role of social learning theory in alcohol use? Social learning theory involves observing others' behaviors and the consequences of others' behaviors and using these observations to guide one's own behavior. Research shows that children as young as three years of age are able to observe and learn patterns of alcohol use in their own families. They also learn that when mother gets upset, she can have a glass of wine and calm down. This sets an expectancy associated with the alcohol use. If upset, have some wine. Another example is when sometimes people don't know how to behave in a certain situation. They look at others and do the same thing. Many adolescents use alcohol because their peers do it, which is the process of social referencing. Let's talk about theory of reasoned behavior. Reasoned behavior refers to the tendency of individuals to calculate costs and benefits associated with behavioral choices. Typically, 
when making a decision whether or not to use alcohol, another substance, an individual would engage in an internal mental debate about the possible positive versus negative outcomes. For example, on the one hand, they can enjoy friends and positive feelings. On the other hand, drugs are expensive and they can get in trouble with family or police. Developmental theories. Relatively recently, scholars have begun to argue that substance use disorder is a developmental disorder. The idea behind this approach comes from the fact that genetic and neurobiological risk factors tend to interact with the exposure to adverse life experiences and protective mechanisms. Together, they result in a certain pattern of behaviors, including alcohol use, over time. On this slide, we can see that the earlier children start using alcohol, the higher is the risk of developing lifetime alcohol dependence. This slide shows that young adults have the highest level of binge alcohol use. Over time, many people transition to family and employment. Those who continue high-risk alcohol use may not survive to be included in the later age groups. The adolescent brain undergoes dramatic developmental changes and functional revisions as part of normal development. The synaptic and myelination revisions do not occur evenly and concurrently throughout the brain. For example, the areas responsible for inhibitory control over behavior do not keep up with the same pace of change as areas responsible for initiating behaviors. This explains why adolescents might behave more impulsively, exhibiting less inhibitory control over their behavioral choices. During the 50s and 60s, Morton Jelinek suggested that alcoholism follows a natural course over time, a course characterized by four distinct stages, pre-alcoholic, early alcoholic, middle alcoholic, and late alcoholic. More recent studies demonstrated dynamic, consistently changing nature of addiction behaviors. A typical substance misuse trajectory begins during adolescence or emerging adulthood, declines or escalates during emerging and early adulthood. Then, it either declines or extends into adulthood, possibly but not necessarily meeting criteria of substance use disorder. This figure shows the multiple trajectories and the iterative nature of the possible trajectories. For example, a person can move back and forth between control, risky, disordered drinking, and no alcohol use at all. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration produced a fact sheet through the Center of the Application of Prevention Technique discussing prevention as part of a behavioral health continuum of care. This continuum of care framework is applicable to intervening around substance misuse and substance use disorder. Promotion Promotion strategies are strength-based interventions designed to build resilience and promote well-being. Prevention Universal prevention are interventions that are delivered to the general population without differentiating between persons at different risk levels. For example, schools may deliver drug awareness and resistance education programming to all students regardless whether they belong to a vulnerability or risk group selective prevention is more targeted than universal and these interventions would be directed toward populations identified as having a potential somewhat greater than the general population for developing problem use for example it might be aimed at youth who live with one or more parents or family members engaged in substance misuse. The indicated prevention is even more targeted, delivered to individuals showing warning signs foreshadowing the development of the problem use. For example, to prevent alcohol use disorder, interventions might be directed to youth or emerging adults engaged in binge drinking. Treatment services are for people diagnosed with a substance use or other behavioral health disorder. Recovery. Recovery services support individuals' compliance with long-term treatment and aftercare. 
The transtheoretical model of behavior change is a model of the processes and stages typically experienced in the course of intentional behavior change. The model originally emerged in transtheoretical analysis of psychotherapies and was described by Prochaska and Di Clemente. It was then applied to the process of change in smoking behavior and other addictive behaviors. The developers distilled from research and clinical observation a set of principles describing behavior change processes and factors that facilitate opposed barriers to achieving change goals. The change is seen as a circular and not linear process. Precontemplation is the absence of an intent to change the identified behavior. A person in the contemplation stage demonstrates awareness of a problem and serious consideration of making a change without making a specific change commitment. A preparation stage extends beyond an intent to change. It includes early change behaviors toward the goal of taking serious action within the next 30 days. People will have set a plan in motion, even if not actively engaged in it yet, and will set a target day for the action to begin. The action stage is characterized by a person actively taking very specific, concrete steps to change the target behavior and keep the change momentum going. For a behavior as complex as quitting drinking, for example, the person may engage in a host of strategic alternative behaviors, including avoiding the people, places, and situations that tempt them to drink, applying strategies for controlling their mood and stress management, grocery shopping online, to avoid impulse alcohol purchases in the store. Once a person has engaged in action behaviors for at least six months, they may move into a maintenance phase, which is a period of continued vigilance against relapsing to the past behavior. Let's talk about treatment needs. Research suggests that 3.9% perceived a need for specialized alcohol treatment during the past year. 1.6% made an effort to receive treatment. There is currently no consensus on the need for formal treatment for alcohol abuse. While many clients get help from therapy providers, many others can successfully reduce their drinking problems without professional help. People who have developed the alcohol use disorder may benefit from behavioral counseling, coping skills training interventions, contingency management, behavioral couples and family therapies, or medication-assisted treatments. Detoxification might be necessary to safely manage the withdrawal period. Chronic, heavy alcohol consumption interferes with normal organ functioning and causes structural damage in virtually every tissue of the body. The liver is especially susceptible to alcohol-induced damage. Alcohol also damages the gastrointestinal tract, pancreas, heart, and bones. However, after cessation of alcohol consumption, Organs can recover. Even after years of heavy alcohol use, the liver can regenerate and restore its function. Other organs also show improved functioning and recovery after abstinence. The fact that body has an incredible potential for recovery makes it particularly important to focus on treatment even in cases of prolonged, heavy alcohol use. Studies showing fMRI clearly show that heavy, repeated, chronic substance misuse leads to changes in brain functioning. These changes remain long time after substance abuse stops. Over time, however, brain begins to recover. These magnetic resonance images of the living brains show the contrast between an alcoholic woman who continues to drink and one who maintains sobriety. In the lower panel for each woman, we see expansion of the lateral ventricles with continued drinking 
and reduction in the lateral ventricles with continued sobriety. In the upper panels, we see that a lesion in the pons, clearly visible in the first image, has resolved after a year of sobriety. A recovery orientation refers to a host of values, beliefs, and behaviors related to how individuals engage in and experience the process of recovery from a substance use disorder. The recovery orientation is fundamentally informed by the individual's own definitions of the problems, solutions, and subjective experiences rather than those being imposed by others. Built into this orientation are issues such as having individuals define for themselves what constitutes recovery. This may or may not include abstinence as a goal, for example. Another aspect has to do with adopting a holistic view where individual recovery is embedded in the context of all life structures, functions, and wellness, including their future growth and development as a person, not just changes in the past substance use behavior. Therefore, recovery does not simply mean achieving the abstinence of disease,